Sākumā bija tā, ka katru reizi tāds patīkams pārsteigums, bet tagad jau tas ir kā norma. Saprot to, ka tie zibi maksājumi ir tiešām burtiski divas sekundes, un tas nav reklāmas triks. Faktiski katru reizi, kad es pārskaitu tās zibi maksājumu, un īstenībā tas ir ļoti bieži. Gan arī skatni vairākas reizes dienā ir, teiksim, es vienmēr piedomāju, cik ļoti labi ir, kad ir tāds zibi maksājums, kad var to visu ļoti ātri izdarīt. Pārts mēnešus pirms tam redzēju paziņojumu visādās ziņu aģentūrās, ka tāda iespēja būs. Parādījies liela interese, ka man patīk visi jaunas tehnoloģijas paskatīties, vai tas tik tiešām būs tik ātri. Pēc tam jau bija noteikta diena, kad tas parādīsies. Latvijas bankā bija pat publicēts saraksts ar visām bankām. Ilgi meklēju Latvijas bankas tajā visā Eiropas sarakstā. Bija ļoti priecīgs atrast abas savas bankas. Sajūtos, ka es kontrolēju savas finanses, ka es varu pārskaitīt to naudu. Man liekas, skraidīja pa visu ofisu un teica, ka tas tik tiešām strādā. Tas tiešām bija emocionāls piedzīvojums, jo sanāk, ka es skaitīju no vienas bankas naudu uz otru savu banku, citu banku, piekdienas vakarā ap 5.15. Un normāli līdz šim mēs esam piekrituši, ka maksājums, tas sakot, iekritīs jaunajā kontā tikai pirmdienu rīta pusē, bet man pēc divām sekundēm nopīkstēja saņēmēja bankas aplikācijas maksājums, ka nepatīk skaitļot galvā aiziest tas maksājums vai neaiziest tajā darba dienā. Un tad dažreiz pa dienu, ap kādiem vienam diviem dienā veicot maksājumu, tiksim, mammai, reti, bet sanāk arī mammai skaitīt naudu, tad nevar saprast, vai viņi saņems tajā dienā uz savu kontu vai nesaņems tajā dienā. Kad esi ceļojumā, tev ir neņem līdzi visas kreditkartes vai debetkartes, un tu stāv pie bankomāta un tu zini, ka tev vienā bankā tā nauda ir, otrā bankā tās naudas nav, un tev vajadzētu uzreiz izņemt skaidru naudu, lai veiktu kaut kādu maksājumu. Tad ir ļoti parocīgi, ka var izvilkt mobilo telefonu un uzreiz veikt pārskaitījumu un pat negaidīt, kamēr otrā aplikācijā tā nauda atnāk, uzreiz likt karti un izņemt to naudu. Man uzņēmuma konts gan ir tikai citā bankā, kas vēl šobrīd neatbalsta zibu maksājumus. Un katru reizi šī maksājuma skaitļošana ieslēdzas, kad ir jāapmaksā par kādu preci. Kad ir nosacījums, kad naudzi ir jāsaņem vai nu tajā pašā dienā, vai maksājums ir veikts tad, kad viņš ir iekrits saņēmē bankas kontā, tad tas prasa maksājuma uzdevuma sūtīšanas un tāds nesaprašanās. Darbiniekiem arī konti nav visās bankās, un tad sanāk tā naudas skaitīšana, un ir cevišķi, ka vēl pa vidu nav tikai sestdienas svētdienas, bet arī dažreiz pat sarkanās pirmdienas otrdienas, tad tev nauda dažreiz prasa pat piecas dienas, un tādā vajadzība kā alga iekrīt piecas dienas tālāk kontā. Manā uzņēmē darbībā, kas ir ēdināšana, tur ir vesels komplekts ar pienesumiem. Tie ir ne tikai produkti, tie ir darba algas, tie ir kaut kādi pakalpojumi, kas ir vajadzīgi. Teiksim, jau rītā no rīta viņiem jābūt gataviem, tā tad jāveic pārskaitījums. Es varu daudz ātrāk pasūtīt, es varu daudz ātrāk samaksāt. Ja ir tāda nepieciešamība un uzņēmē darbībā, tas ļoti bieži ir. Es domāju, ka varbūt tirgotāji varētu aktīvāk izmantot to iespēju, ja viņi attīstītu maksājumu apstrādes ātro sistēmu, tad varētu kaut centrāli tirgu un neuztraukties, ka tev nav skaidrās naudas, vienkārši pārskaitīt un uzreiz saņemt to preci. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, so it's still morning, so good morning everyone. My name is Denis Filipovs. I'm a head of uh, payment system policy division at Latvijas Banka. Uh, basically, it means that I lead a group of very passionate experts aiming to facilitate that we have a state of art, efficient, fast, and uh, at low cost processed payment systems and payment instruments in Latvia. And so, those who know me, you also know me as a, just a fintech guy, that fintech guy from Latvijas Banka. I, am, I have an honor to introduce our, our guests here today. So uh, let's start from a beautiful lady, <laughs> so, representing actually fintech landscape, fintech area, and Marilis is a co-founder of uh, PayTeller. Uh, then we have well, let's say celebrity and uh, in, in, in fintech area, Petri Zilgalvis, uh, a, a fintech guru, a technology expert from European Commission. We have uh, 
Vlad Mirono from Citadel Banca, bank who has uh, now uh, an, ambitious to, an ambition to tell that it, it, it's a bank who, which works uh, like a fintech in Latvia. We have uh, my colleague, actually, Madis Müller, representing uh, Esti Bank, Central Bank of Estonia. So you know Estonia is a very digital country. And we have a representative of retailers, so Rimi Baltic, uh, uh, Dines is representing a uh, big retailer in, in terms of Baltic market. So before we move to the panel, and I want to uh, explain that from the, this visionary uh, panel, we are moving uh, uh, towards uh, a more, uh, say, physical things. We are narrowing our scope to Europe, to Baltics, to Latvia, and uh, we are here to speak about near future, so maybe year, two, five, or if you are ready to tell what will happen after 10 years. And, well, I would be happy to stay neutral during the discussion, but now I want to use this opportunity to say my words and my opinion as an expert and, and give you a presentation where we actually stay today with uh, payment technology. Well, as it was already mentioned, and, and Mr. Mersh uh, already touched this topic, uh, according to uh, 2016 data, in the Eurozone, cash was still the king. So around 80% of transactions and POS, so point of sale, were done in cash, and, and with cards, it was only 19%. And as you understand, the majority of those card transactions were actually done by Visa and MasterCard, which are non-EU card schemes. If you look on Latvian situation, well, we have noted a clear and, and obvious trend here. We are moving towards non-cash. We are becoming a cashless society, and the proportion according to our study, this, uh, according to our survey made uh, at the beginning of this year, was that actually 60% of person-to-person -person money transfers, uh, transactions at, at, at point of sale and uh, paying utility bills was done uh, in non-cash. So the proportion is uh, 60 over 40% done in cash. And actually, uh, we have quite similar situation to the common situation in the Eurozone. A 64% of, of cashless payments in Latvia are done by payment cards. Well, actually, as it was already mentioned today, the driving force is a consumer and its evolution. And digital has created a new layer of expectation. And this is quoted by uh, uh, Kelly Wenzel, uh, Director of Global Market at Amazon Pay. And let me explain that, well, for 50 years or even 60 years, we were absolutely happy with physical payment cards. And now we understand that, well, technology allows us to make contactless payments, technology allows us to have a mobile phone as another alternative physical form of our car to make contactless payments. We, we really understand and we really, I would say, desire that we actually have cards directly issued in, into our mobile phones to avoid this physical form, to make our purse smaller, and, and I would not exclude that, that Next desired things would be to have only one app or one functionality in our Android phones or, or iPhones that will allow us just to choose an account I want to pay from. And that's all. The demand and the need of us is very simple. But that technology now allows to do that and, and, and probably it definitely creates a new layer of expectations of what we as a consumers, as a payment service users, want to have. Well, millennials now are, say, from uh, 18 to 35. By the way, I'm 32, so I'm in. 
And the question is, what's, what's wrong with us, guys? Well, the question is probably valid because we are the generation that is quite flexible, that wants to be on public, that likes um, to share their life and, and every, every uh, moment of our life. And we also like a lot of startups, fintechs. We are actually keen to test, to to um, to be open. We are more open to innovation, uh, and 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 that also results in a common approach that we probably trust technology and internet companies more than traditional banking system after the latest crisis. And it mobile device has becoming an extension of us. So we can, we can leave our purse at home, but I would say that I always have my smartphone with me. And therefore, also mobile device and mobile technology is the main driver uh, of this development. Well, a PSD2, Payment Services Directive, was already mentioned today that it probably will be a game changer and just simply explaining the idea to you that it will allow third parties to get an access to customer accounts, to customer data, with the aim to provide better services for customers. Do you know what is about? 0 0.4. Any guess? Well, 0 0.4 seconds. It takes on average to process an instant payment transaction in our infrastructure. Incredibly fast. And for those of you who say, well, guys, well done, call uh, Guinness Record Book. I would say, no, it's not only about the speed. So we have real value proposition for you. Because I have listed a few. Easier bill splitting, instant transfers. Uh, so that transfers 24 seven without no holidays, no weekends. You receive your salary immediately, even if your uh, employer has paid it uh, at Friday evening. And so also businesses can receive customer payments instantly and use money immediately. And, and I would describe it, well, when you sleep, either you uh, take rest, instant payments work for you all the time. <coughs> well, last but not least, let me myself to draw some future path of, of European payments and Latvian payments. First of all, Indeed, I, I, I truly believe that instant payments will become available everywhere and from any device, and, and users shall be uh, able to, uh, to take these benefits, to use this service, and um, especially in, in these uh, uh, times when, when actually payments are becoming invisible, so invisible and instant. I also have noticed as an expert that we already have N26, very successful project of mobile bank. Revolut is applying for a banking license. And I guess that, well, we are going to mobile only banking in Europe. We'll see. And, well, my favorite one. Machine learning, blockchain, artificial intelligence, cloud was mentioned, big data is not a technology, nevertheless, it's a very important term. In my opinion, may revolutionize payments landscape. But let's move further and discuss if it's reality, if it's just my thoughts, do you share them? And uh, before we start, I would like to ask you, well, what actually you are doing, or what, what are you, let's start with plans. So plan is something till the end of this year, maybe plans for next year. Now, uh, how do you plan to promote uh, use of modern technologies in your area? And uh, probably uh, legislators and central banks and regulators are those who have more power to do that. So Patrick, floor is yours. 
how do you plan to promote? Well, some things that we're doing have been indicated in the FinTech Action Plan, which is the Commission's policy document setting out the road ahead for how we can make the most out of the innovative potential of these new technologies in European finance. It was mentioned uh, by Yves Mersch of the ECB, the uh, EIDS regulation, which came into force on the 29th of September, which will allow people to open bank accounts in other EU countries in full compliance with EU law and anti-money laundering. We also ended roaming with another regulatory initiative in my area. And if we speak about uh, the area of fintech, we are also rolling out and have had already had the fintech lab, which is bringing together supervisors and regulators to look at the uptake of new technologies. We did the first one on the cloud. The next one we're doing on artificial intelligence at the end of November. So this is very much the Commission level working with the regulators to see how we can make the uptake of new technologies happen much more quickly, but in the context of complex risk management, which is necessary in this area because we are entering into more complicated systems, cross-border systems, systems where more things are digitalized. Also the area of standards, we're doing a roadmap and with SenSenelec, seeing where there are gaps in the standards area for fintech. Uh, this was emphasized by several speakers that common standards are necessary to lower barriers of entry to make sure that there's a playing field which is a very innovative and open one. Uh, we do see a bit of stalling in the area of the APIs uh, for the implementation of PSD2 and from the digital single market side we'd rather see that uh, move move more quickly to have more opportunity for fintech and, and startup play a few words as well about our upcoming digital program, the Digital Europe program, where there will be investments also for the financial sector in the areas of machine learning, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, and blockchain. On some of the comments that were made by blockchain, I think we can only agree we don't want to be carried away by the hype. It's not something that fits every use case, and I'm also of the personal opinion that payments in Europe, probably within the euro area, doesn't really gain great efficiency from it at this moment. But we are actually developing a European blockchain services infrastructure for RegTech, which would be addressing areas of tax, customs, compliance clients, which where we see from proof of concept, this would be greatly more efficient, saving between 30 to 80 percent for national administrations and lowering compliance costs for private businesses. This could eventually be rolled out to more anti-money laundering and know your customer in collaboration with the private sector. And in this context, we're also looking at possible, and it's always a possibility because an alternative can always be to do nothing in an area, but possible legislative initiatives on smart contracts and barriers to rolling out blockchain in various sectors. And so, uh, how to say, looking forward to the discussions further and, and to the inputs, and I can also say a little bit more what we're doing in the funding area and in uh, collaboration in regulatory innovation and regulatory sandboxes later during the uh, rest of the discussion. Thank you. Very interesting. Could you please uh, explain us more? So you, as a regulator, have different kinds of instruments, as you mentioned, to, to facilitate or to regulate. And probably, well, are those instruments developing from the regulations and, and directives? We are, you have mentioned standardization. So what are the instruments and uh, why we are doing such a shift to, are they more flexible instruments? Are they, do they suit a fintech area more? Well, we're a little bit a special place in the commission. I'm in DG Connect and Digital Single Market. So we both do infrastructure funding, research funding, policy, and legislation. The legislation we do is horizontal. It's like roaming, ending roaming charges, ending geo-blocking, EID, uh, the Cybersecurity Act, as I say, possibly smart contracts and barriers to roll out of blockchain across sectors. Um, 
And then we also utilize guidelines, recommendations, the upcoming uh, free flow of data, which is also very important for the financial sector. It will open up the use of the cloud. It will be accompanied by a code of conduct for data portability so that when a bank or financial act, other financial actor or other sectoral actor utilizes a cloud, they're not locked in. They can port the data somewhere else. We're starting with a code of conduct. We have to also work within what is politically possible in the world of the parliament and the uh, and the council and uh, in this way we choose the best instruments as i mentioned also in funding this european blockchain services infrastructure it's with 27 countries 26 european states and uh, norway and with switzerland probably joining soon and probably the other two eu countries but we're going to start financing that the first applications which as i say probably will be in the reg tech area to do with regulatory reporting and registers and we'll finance that through the Connecting Europe facility which also finances things like Rail Baltica which uh, all of us in, in this part of the world know and um, the next steps then could be in the Digital Europe program and this could be accompanied by legislation so we take this kind of holistic point of view but I should underline that legislation let's say specifically just for the financial sector is with the colleagues in, in DG FISMA the financial sector colleagues so the Payment Services Directive to MIFID and others, but we work very closely with them in things like the FinTech Task Force that I co-chair, as well as uh, with the private stakeholders who I'm happy to hear from soon. <laughs> okay, sounds very complicated. Well, Madis, so central banks not having a supervisory function, what can we do, how we can speed up the adoption of technologies in payments? Well, thank you. Thank you first for having me here today. If you ask me what are we doing uh, at the Estonian Central Bank Eesti Bank uh, when it comes to the uh, payments area then, uh, well, broadly speaking, it's, uh, it's more or less, the principles are the same as, uh, as uh, Mr. Mersch already explained from the Eurosystem perspective, whereas we are the, uh, uh, the national uh, central bank then bringing it to, to the country level, plus we have some uh, special features in, I suppose, every country, given the local environment. But overall, what we really care about at the central bank is to have uh, efficient, secure, smooth payment systems. Uh, I would say we have uh, uh, we have three roles in in that regard, and uh, three sort of areas uh, uh, that we are active in. Well, first of all, the central bank as a as an operator of uh, payment systems, we have target two now uh, tips for the uh, uh, for the instant payments, and that's already a, a really a huge. Uh, I would, I would think uh, innovation and a step from the central bank's uh, side that was uh, uh, discussed in the first panel and I can tell you later about how it's going in Estonia in terms of uh, implementation. Uh, second, we view our role also as, uh, as that of a catalyst to uh, the market development in Estonia. Uh, we have uh, uh, sort of a convening power so we can bring uh, uh, bring together banks, uh, independent payment service providers, uh, uh, merchants, consumer representatives and have discussions on what, uh, what the Estonian market uh, could benefit from, what are the new, new developments, how we should uh, uh, approach this uh, in Estonia or how we should implement a particular uh, uh, regulation even if it's coming from a, from a European level to make sure that it's really as harmonized as possible and, uh, and really we have the, uh, uh, have the uh, reachability in terms of customers of different uh, <coughs> financial service providers being able to send money to, uh, uh, to whatever other account or service provider in Estonia or outside. So this is, this is something we, uh, uh, we care about uh, very much. And, uh, and finally, this is a bit more specific to Estonia. We have uh, uh, we have a particular mandate to make sure that uh, the, at least the key service, uh, payment service providers have uh, uh, the business continuity uh, aspects thought out thoroughly enough. And we, as a central bank, we have uh, uh, introduced certain requirements in terms of uh, the maximum downtimes and uh, all the business continuity plans that they have to uh, have to uh, submit to the central bank for approval because we really want to make sure that the payment system is reliable and uh, mm -hmm. and meets the needs of our people okay clear 
Well, uh, market participants quite often complaining about overregulation, but now I would ask you, well, what regulators, central banks, supervisors can do more to speed up an adoption of technology, use of technology, so to, to help you actually. So, Marilis? Well, I think everybody understands by now that the user expectations have changed rapidly and uh, that the payment uh, kind of ecosystem needs to change with it. Um, but let's face it, the customer expectations didn't, um, didn't change or haven't changed because of what central banks have been doing. They have been changed or have been changing because of uh, what the companies have been doing. And usually the companies are startups. The very unique thing about startups is that they usually are established to solve a very specific problem in the market. So when we take the customer experience. Uh, when we were 20 years ago, nobody would have imagined that we s use an app and uh, get a taxi and then we just walk out of the car without actually physically paying. And by now, this is, this is the new set of norm normality. So um, when we see the regulations, I don't think it's, uh, it's fast enough, I guess, because the, um, the disruptive innovation that um, that startups are actually providing and when we talk about payments uh, in specific then fintechs are actually creating that new um, way of doing or paying or new ways of using the services and then it happens anyway and it's usually much faster than the central banks can adopt with. And I think that when we talk about BST2 in specific, it's a very good example of how you put those kind of like two, so what, what has been so far a little bit separately, that the banking system and then the startups and especially fintech startups. And I think that I felt uh, as a fintech startup co-founder, I've felt uh, quite a lot that uh, banks or people are terrified that you know you come as a fintech startup and then you take out all the banking but it's not the case and I think that the BSD2 regulation is a very good example of how it kind of like enhances the cooperation between two things and it can actually make uh, the journey for the customer better and this is the core core of it okay what from the bank's perspective? Um, from the bank's perspective, I would say, I think it's just wrong misconception that banks are not trying to be uh, a front runners, but uh, for banks to be in the front runner seat, it's much harder mm -hmm. to innovate today. And you know, then, uh, there is a, such a big difference on the jurisdiction space, and it was touched in the previous panel, that if you think about the Europe, it's so split. Mm -hmm. And some jurisdiction have an advantage over another. And FinTech have, I think, more right to choose where to go and under which jurisdiction to develop the service or product mm -hmm. and launch it and scale it for passporting across the Europe. And if you get back to the bank perspective, so for bank, you still need to comply with a lot of elements and this innovation becomes much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, if we step a little bit back and think about what we're actually doing with the instant payment, so I think we're changing the basic, the fundamentals. And uh, I really like to come back to the basic concept of four-party model on which uh, the car uh, operates today. We know that it's all about acquirers, issuers, consumers, and merchants. And what I think we did with the instant payment, we put this basic. So. Uh, acquiring really the, the rails, they start operating. And a lot of this legislation enabling the payment processing, but a lot of legislation uh, and changes need to cover the elements which are across. We need to develop a common solution across Europe so we enable quick client onboarding uh, to, uh, to the solution, to the fintechs or the banks. So you can identify yourself, you can jump on the new service, and you can start using it instantly. Once this has happened, then we can go into the completely new verticals. And the POS change was touched already. I think 
changing the way the uh, POS market operates today, creating alternatives of how you actually going to do less of cash payments, but more of the alternative payments facilitated through instant payment, is just a question of time. But we will need to check the digital identity. We will need to figure out how we align IML rules and uh, client monitoring. We will need to see the quick and easy adoption of this solution. Because one important topic, which I think each of us, whether we are fintechs or banks or regulator, which we need to keep in mind, it's about how we're going to bring the trust to clients. And card schemes and old batch infrastructure, it's currently having this sense of trust. Because people got used to the things they actually, you know, embedded in their behavior and then we need to create this new behavior. And once this uh, behavior is created, it's proved. That's the moment when actually it, it, it can uh, easily go live. But a lot of changes across the different universes will need to happen. Thank you very interesting point. Well, Dan, what is the position of big retailers? Is uh, a payment option or, or options offered to, to make a payment in, in stores is a part of positive or consumer uh, consumer experience for you and and what would you expect from from commercial banks uh, helping you acquire payments from your customers and and from fintechs as well so <clears throat> thank you for the question um, I think from a retailer perspective, uh, definitely the customer experience of buying is really fundamental. It's what distinguishes buying from one location to another, be it online or in a physical location. And the payment process is part of that experience for sure. So <clears throat> we definitely look at what will be that experience for customers as they have different ways of uh, paying for the purchase that they're making. Um, I think our observation, I think it's no surprise for others, is there's a, a vast array of options being offered. Uh, we have many mobile wallets being offered to us, I think perhaps from even from several panelists here. Um, so we have the choices for a retailer for which types of payment op options to make are very vast at the moment. Mm -hmm. And there are significant costs at adopting any one of them uh, and therefore picking which one to go with is quite a, a, a difficult task and it, it's asking the retailer to invest heavily when it's uncertain which technology actually will dominate. So I think there's a couple of things that come out of this. One, uh, for the companies offering or the banks offering these services, it's quite important to take the consumer perspective. How widely will it be possible to adopt this technology and how is the pricing of the technology really affecting that? Because uh, if I, as a consumer, still need to pay a monthly fee for, for using my card to buy at stores that don't have mobile payments or don't have other support, then I still have that cost as a consumer for as long as there are places where I still need to pay. And I even need, we have cash to pay for the parking when we don't have mobile payments. So those legacy payments carry costs for the consumers. And unless we look at models for really removing those double costs while we're using new technologies, there will always be that, that barrier that a consumer is being expected to, to invest in every new payment method and hold them all in parallel just to be able to uh, buy at different locations. So from a, <clears throat> from a retailer perspective, we look quite strongly on how much is their standardization for the given technologies that are being looked at. Is there likelihood that it really could be mass adoption around them uh, to really reduce the likelihood that a consumer is going to end up with a, a business model where they wouldn't want to be investing in multiple payments at the same time. And I think the banks have opportunities since the cards are being also issued by the banks where there's a monthly fee for the card. There is possibilities to bundle modern payment options together with card payment fees and potentially create service offerings to consumers that would actually encourage them to be switching to this, that would reduce that barrier. Thank you for your insight. Well, uh, actually, that was a great start in my opinion, uh, but the next question I would like to address not only to you guys, but also to our audience. And therefore, I would invite you and, and in mind that we actually have slido.com uh, functionality. And I would invite you to do some uh, activity by taking your smartphone and uh, join the voting here. And uh, well, the 
actually, there are four options to answer. And how do you see the potential of instant payments in euro? Do you see them as a, well, just a good opportunity to make mobile P2P payments? No. Oh, I have a good alternative to, uh, to um, cash. Uh, then another option is that it's just a premium service. So it will stay as a premium service only. Uh, however, it could also uh, lead to a new models in e-commerce. For example, well, I don't need to pay in advance. I can wait for delivery. Uh, be sure that, that the price is uh, that uh, the actual item is uh, and, and my purchase is. is rightly uh, organized and, and uh, so I have received the, the, the item uh, and it was correctly described on the web page and I just pay in that moment when I just receive it. Uh, or the, the, the fourth option is uh, that instant payments actually should be a new normal for any payments in Eurozone. But well, as I mentioned, it's also a, a question to a panel, therefore, um, well, what are your views? Is it a payment under a second and 24-7 mode without no holidays, no weekends? Is it a premium service or new normal or will become maybe new normal? So, I don't know. I get, what? I get that. So, um, uh, I think uh, we're moving to uh, to the moment that it's, it's actually becoming a new normal. If you think uh, what was the market landscape prior to instant payment, there were only like few institutions on the banking side who were able to provide it cross country, and the, these were like more of the largest groups. So banks operating like in the several markets, even if they can use same infrastructure, they can give, give you the quicker payments, which would be like maybe in a matter of days. Then we got some fintechs like TransferWise and like Revolut who tried to change the way uh, the payments happening. And then you look at the US and Zillow, which powers now uh, the transfers in between the banks. They just provide like, you know, alternative solutions for people actually quickly get the money. What we have think done in Europe, we actually said, okay, we can build the scheme which will be like basically instant. And we, I think as a Citadel from the very beginning were really advocates of that because we thought that that's what really consumer need. If you think like today, we as a consumers, we'll, we do live interactions. Everything what happens, it's, it's actually live. Same we would expect with the payments. If you compare card payments to your, to your cash payments, actually cash payment is better than the card because it happens like almost instantly. You just take your cash and you pay for the good. Not the same for the card because uh, in a lot of cases, card transaction takes just a couple of days. So if I look back, like since November we launched it, uh, we see that uh, more than 20% of all the payments are already instant. And that's only with like uh, two banks here operating uh, in the Baltics and uh, doing that. And I think uh, much more uh, for sure across the Europe, but like, you know, Baltic to Europe are very little amount of payments. Uh, so think about that. Every fifth payment with few bank already instant. And uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of positive credit coming from the consumers. But in order most probably to push it to the new normal, I think more initiative should come similar to like in Netherlands, similar to what is thought of like of the Belgium, where actually the banks think that it's a new standard. Uh, it should come as a new standard because it will change infrastructure, it will decrease the cost, it will create a new business models uh, for e-commerce, it will create new business model for the physical POS, for invoicing, it will actually decrease general cost of business, but instant payment actually can be enabler also for the uh, much broader things. We can improve my taxation, we can improve cash cycles for the companies, which will uh, ultimately bring to the economy. It will decrease a credit cost, it will decrease amount of debt. So we need really to see that this new normal is actually already here, but it is an enabler for, for something more, and which is definitely not a premium service. Thank you. So, 
we have uh, more or less stable results now. I would ask, for example, Madis, are you really surprised? Uh, no, I'm not surprised. And uh, let me tell you my views because I turned off my phone. I couldn't uh, respond to the poll. Uh, but what we're seeing in Estonia and what I hope will, uh, will uh, hopefully take place in uh, Europe more broadly is really that it, uh, uh, the instant payment will become a new normal. I would actually all, I would have picked both uh, uh, option one and three because uh, in addition to just being new normal for payments, it really, I believe, has uh, real potential for, uh, uh, for new models in e-commerce and not only e-commerce but also at, uh, at the physical point of sale and with uh, transacting with a mer merchant because there are uh, uh, economic or financial incentives for, uh, for all parties to do that. Uh, you have, uh, as a merchant, you uh, you get your uh, you get your money immediately from the uh, from a customer. Otherwise, you you always have to wait uh, I don't, a day, for example. You need more work working capital. It may be cheaper than uh, uh, than card uh, transaction fees, for example. Uh, so I, I I'm really excited to see what what could come up in terms of new. Uh, uh, new services as a result of uh, uh, instant payments being really widely used. But whether it's a premium, premium service or not, then in Estonia at least, as a central bank, we have also been very vocal in, uh, well, first of all, uh, explaining the benefits of uh, instant, instant payments and also saying that in our opinion it should be the new normal, not a premium service. Uh, we, uh, we are very glad to see that now, uh, uh, by the end of the year, we have uh, uh, three major banks that will bring the uh, instant payments uh, to the market. Uh, by that, we cover uh, or 90, I think almost 95% of the payments market, which shows you how concentrated the, uh, the industry is. But, uh, uh, but indeed, all three of them, they have said that for them, this will be the new, uh, a new standard. There will be no additional fees compared to the old and slower payments, and which means that probably it will be the uh, the new uh, new standard for re retail payments between accounts at different banks. So, yeah, so is, I hope this this is the direction it will take also in Europe more broadly. And just comment on the mobile uh, person to person uh, payments. I think it's really important that it will not be uh, a standard only for a particular platform, say mobile payments, because we have uh, the example of, uh, I think I know of at least of one uh, uh, country in Europe, or in, also in the Euro area, that has uh, introduced uh, instant payments as a, as a solution, as of now at least, for only mobile payments. And they, since, since they use the uh, local, uh, local uh, numbers, and so there's a no, lo local system for um, uh, for uh, for the uh, mobile number space, sort of the lookup system for uh, for payments and for identifying accounts, it would not be possible for an Estonian bank customer to send an instant payment to uh, uh, to, to an account in the in the other country. So it's really it's really important that we have uh, uh, reachability and uh, and the common approach also throughout Europe. And I hope we will get there. I'm, I'm really proud to compliment here and say that uh, it was already mentioned today that we expect Swedbank to join the club and uh, start offering uh, instant payments uh, uh, this October as this month and, um, and we will have the same, quite similar situation. So uh, more than 80% uh, of uh, payment service user account holders will have an access and, and opportunity to make instant payments here in Latvia. And can we say that in that way we are we in Baltics we, we did a perfect job and and so we perfectly uh, address customer needs delivering this or still it depends on the end user solutions and we need to wait a bit and see how this will evolve. Well if I may just to uh, add uh, and, and answer to your uh, to your question. Of course, I th when you when you say we, then uh, we <laughs> central take, banks. Uh, it's not only central <laughs> banks, but it's really the uh, the whole community uh, yeah. uh, in our countries. Uh, and I think it's really 
it's really important that we now have this uh, instant payment as a new normal, which is the first step, and only then you will have all the uh, all those uh, new business models uh, that could develop as a as a next step. Uh, perhaps we have less. Uh, uh, can be less involved in that uh, as uh, central bankers, but, uh, but again, still we have uh, we have the uh, those n payment forums and uh, and can bring together different uh, uh, different uh, parties to uh, sort of discuss the possibilities and perhaps encourage those developments. But it's really, I think, it's really up to the private sector. Marlies, may I ask, would you expect that central banks still continue to take a part and uh, help to uh, modulate? I, I know, facilitate this discussion with market participants in order to, uh, to, to support uh, delivery of end-user solution, good, efficient... Well, it needs to be a discussion anyway, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, who needs to benefit from it is the end customer and the businesses and the merchants. So in order to provide the kind of service that would be faster and cheaper for, for either the user or the merchants, there has to be a dialogue between the market participants and the legislator. Well, but you, you're an expert in... in, in uh, customer uh, expectations and uh, how to how to address the needs and uh, how to deliver those benefits well in my opinion many users do not actually care what is what what infrastructure uh, payment products has behind and uh, well the question is actually how modern payment instruments can provide more benefits are there, should, should they be delivered with uh, value-added services, different kind of services? It was mentioned that actually uh, databases linking account numbers to mobile phone numbers would be a good, uh, good functionality to be added to instant payments. And, and well, you also uh, you were very positive about payment services directive. So how this directive will affect payment landscape and, and actually your business and, and what benefits will it bring to end users? That was a long question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you started off by saying that uh, as an end customer it would be lovely if you had just one app and you could do everything with an app. I think the problem with, well not problem, but uh, challenge with fintechs nowadays is that there is all this innovation but it's quite fragmented. So I think that um, BSD2 will help to bring it together and by boosting the competition it's actually um, creating more coherent view on, on the services that, that, is, that are provided. Um, I think in terms of customer user experience or customer behavior, yes, I think that it would be lovely to have a one single app that uh, that enables you to access services and and do the payments. But as you said rightfully, it's not about the payment, it's about uh, buying or the experience in, in general. So I think that in terms of BSD2 regulation, it brings, brings some sanity in it or common sense in it. So, um, and yes, it should at the end of the day kind of um, release or um, it's, it's all about the data at the end of the day and it, not only the big data but also the banking and payment data which could actually be a benefit to both sides, the banks, the fintechs and the customer because when we talk about customer experience again then um, we're a little bit afraid especially in the light of GDPR uh, of the old data and how it's presented and used and uh, Teppo made an example of uh, Apple and they possess all this data but what they're going to use it for but it actually can be used for good as well because if you take the merchant side um, you can actually use this data from payments to, to customer behavior to provide better service and that's what it's all about. I mean, technologically, everything is possible nowadays. It's possible that, you know, um, we will talk about the future probably later, but everything is possible. And when we take the example of uh, grab and go, which means that at the end of the day, the mobile wallet is just an interface and people are still in the phase where they kind of need this. Well, they think that contactless is uh, innovation. It's really not. So 
for for users to experience that to kind of like smoothly adopt these behavioral changes it takes time and it takes the whole uh, market participants the whole ecosystem to support it if i could add to, <coughs> add to that i think the payment services, uh, PSD2, and other uh, standardization from the central banks, be it European or in the, the countries, is actually really positive for the innovation that comes because it gives a focus for the, for the fintechs and for the innovators to standardize around some platforms. And that standardization really vastly improves the possibility to adopt. So I, I would very much encourage more of that on a, both a European and a central bank level because it really helps drive that uh, positive innovation in the market. Okay. okay, so we touched uh, customer behavior uh, that is changing and uh, so uh, the needs uh, are different, becoming different and we need to find ways to how, to, how to deliver the best experience. Uh, before we proceed and go further with this uh, fundamental discussion, may I ask if you have any questions from the audience? No, any because slide we don't questions? have anything on the screen, so I here. Well, very good. So let's uh, find uh, something interesting. Let's take the first one. Uh, it has more likes uh, than other. Uh, why instant payment would be more convenient in physical shop compared to NFC payment by wearable or mobile? Um, I, I yeah, think I, so I can take it. Uh, to my mind, uh, uh, the interface for which you will actually manage the payment can stay same. NFC, variable, mobile, but as we discussed, uh, it's uh, what, what we're creating is actually instant mechanism for you to, to, to do the quick and easy transfer. Because if you think today, payment uh, which happens is paid by the merchant mm -hmm. and the client. So, uh, and actually everything is in the end paid by the client because it's built in the final price. <laughs> and uh, think about that, uh, we say that the cost for running instant payment is a uh, very, 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 very small part of one cent. So, which means that uh, the big fees will be just walking away from the market. and. Uh, uh, banks are not running the big margins and uh, we currently with the new EU regulations see that Visa and MasterCard they are pushed to decrease uh, the fees uh, for, ret uh, for retail clients or like the private individuals but the cost in the end comes to merchants which means it's in the end come to consumers. Mm -hmm. So uh, here the question is that uh, the interface which we're going to develop, it can be as convenient as today. You either tap your bracelet, you tap your phone, you do the eye contact or like scan the QR. It, it just really doesn't matter. What matters is what sits behind, what is the speed and the cost of the transaction. Well, I mean, I think we have to take a holistic, uh, consumer-centered perspective. As it says, what is good for competition that gets the best price, the best choice? We have to be technologically neutral as the European Commission and I think as the central banks because there will be new technologies. Also, when we speak in other areas about blockchain, DLT, I mean, we'll probably never put that in a piece of legislation. We'll use some kind of decentralized, resilient system. So, I mean, I think, again, uh, a holistic approach, what's best for the consumer and and, I mean, I think we should move as quickly as the fastest adopters, the millennials, to give this choice, but not forgetting other groups of society that might not so quickly adopt these methods that there are still ways for them to pay to be able to uh, conduct their, their transactions in shops and in other places. But I think it is... Uh yeah, I guess you may take the third and fourth one. So uh, there is big interest uh, on uh, uh, from to, to understand retail's perspective. Uh, well, what currently is preferred method of payment, cash versus non-cash, and uh, uh, yeah, they switched. And and then uh, what about future? And um, I would try to 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 make it more precise. Would you be happy to have? Several physical 
alternatives, uh, terminals, I don't know, QR code functionality, either you would give preference to something unified and what is the view. So current current situation, what is the, what, what, what is the best way, uh, what is the preferred mean of payment and, and a bit of future. So our current situation, we uh, definitely have, a, I think our percentage of cashless is higher than the, the Latvian percentage. Um, so we definitely see that as quite predominant. But we also see a, a fairly sizable segment that would not, for example, use our cashless self-checkout because they insist on using cash for whatever reason. But that is a reality. And for us to say we will only serve cashless would mean losing a sizable segment in the market. So I think it's that different consumers having different needs is something that we as a retailer have to cover all of those needs or decide not to service the, the, the customers that choose a certain payment type of method. Um, so in, in terms of, what was the second part of the question? Looking at... Yeah, and uh, future. So if, for example, future delivers you, well, you need to take cash, accept cards, acquire instant payments uh, with, in a way by QR code, and well, what does it mean for retail? So, so we are uh, regularly looking at different, adding different ways of paying. Um, I think we launched yesterday mobile payments, which are QR code based in Lithuania. Um, we have already been accepting uh, Citadella's mobile payments also in, in Latvia since they were launched. Um, so we do add those as different ways, and I agree with the, the previous discussion about POS terminals. They will evolve, whether it mo moves more towards a QR code or some other way of connecting us, you know, passing that information from the, retail, from the consumer to the retailer. That technical form will change over time, and we're looking at different technologies as they come around to try them out. Uh, we, uh, we are keen to try and avoid having you know, many different technical devices that are then confusing for customers. So it's trying to keep that simple, easy uh, experience for, for consumers, and that sometimes is a barrier to trying out every, every new thing that's out there. Uh, but uh, we're definitely looking at different ways of adding those options, being mindful that there's not many that we can take away at the moment. We can't remove cash, we can't remove cards, without losing anyone who's non-European and wants to buy in our stores. Uh, instant payments won't solve us for there. So we still have to support many of those legacy payment methods uh, unless we want to lose customers. And that then is a cost for us to make sure we're compliant with that. Okay. So there is one question, one, a general one, but I would like to skip it to the end. And uh, so I, I see that, that you also have noticed, Madis, that, that it's addressed also to you. But nevertheless, let's uh, let's keep uh, closer to the our topic we uh, we, we currently discuss. And uh, well, Vlad, so you are. A bank already offering instant payments. Just could you briefly comment? Well, is bank ready to operate 24/7? Because there was mentioned kind of holidays, banking holidays, and uh, well, about this uh, processing we instant payment channel by default. So. We do instant payment by default. So uh, once Swedbank joins, as you said, 80% of the payments uh, in the country will be by default. I think that was, uh, the limits will go up gradually. When we launched instant payment as the first bank, you know, we, we started uh, with like a lower limit of, I think, a thousand euro. We fairly quickly went to the five thousand euro, and and then you know we 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 we're gonna go to the full limit. But with the, these limits, you actually already give 99% almost of, the, of your customers uh, the chance uh, to do the very quick transfers. And there is no such a thing as a, as a holidays anymore once you are in the instant payment world. Great. Well, we'll be back to, to our list of questions. But I would like to proceed and well, start with actually Henry Ford quote. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And the question is, well, do we have to wait while customers ask for innovative payment instruments or we can try to build the future ourselves and to deliver? So are we supplier side, central banks, 
and, and retails always the best to know how to how to actually deliver best customer experience and the question I would maybe start from Madis asking well from the center, central bank point of view how to how to uh, how to proceed should we should we clarify the benefit should we uh, create some kind of, of desire and willingness to use these new services and request new services either we should wait uh, until customer understand what he needs well first of all I, I don't think we at the central banks are the the best people to uh, really understand the customer <laughs> right. experience and uh, and what uh, what every uh, customer at the store would possibly want. Nevertheless, we are kind of adept of instant payments now, so we yes. see the benefits and we try to to explain and invite to use them. Yes, but having said that, of course, for uh, for the money uh, to move faster, I think it's it's still obvious to uh, to see the. Uh, uh, see the uh, economic benefits to that. We have this capability of uh, bringing together uh, together different uh, uh, different sides of, you know, say, the financial services providers, uh, merchants, uh, consumers, and so on, being also close to the uh, 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 to the regula regulation and being sort of part of the process, even if it's driven really by the governments. But uh, we often often have a role in that as well. Plus this uh, this role as a as an operator for uh, for certain uh, systems, I think central banks still have a unique uh, uh, role to play in that. But in terms of what is the actual uh, sort of customer service and how to best offer uh, offer a particular service to uh, uh, to a person, then I would leave that to Marilise, and, uh, and she can probably do a better job. Uh, Paytel delivers uh, very creative and innovative solutions. How how do you find the way that actually to that that particular solution is is needed? That it solves and addresses customer need. Well, this is the thing that I emphasized earlier: is that when you're a startup, you're actually in the market, listening to the market, and um, responding very quickly to the needs of. Uh, of the actual, um, let's say, expectations. And it's not the expectations only of uh, people or the end users who use the wallet or the interface, whatever you create, but it's also about uh, the merchants. So there is the, the picture is a bit wider. Um, so because at the end of the day, uh, who decides how you pay is the merchant. And um, many of the companies that nowadays um, are providing different kinds of uh, fintech services or, or like say wallets, they're very focused on the customer experience and the user face and uh, kind of like that it's a nice, nice to have features like you can roll around the bubbles and whatever. But at the end of the day, it needs to be um, valuable for the merchant and not only based on uh, costs but also based on what else you can do with it. The loyalty, the data, and then how you present it to the customer. So it's about how this whole system works together. So at the end of the day, I think that the data and technology is just a raw material. The, f the fact is that it's used by people and people are irrational. They have feelings, they have needs, and this is the kind of like the core of user experience is that you respond to those needs and those feelings but do you go uh, as a central bank do you go the same path so uh yeah, you follow the same approach i think uh you, you need to think here like uh it's not really about payment it's all about experience mm -hmm. It's about really uh, understanding why consumer would need it and what problem for the consumer it's going to solve. So think about like saying like Uber. They're actually solving uh, decent problems. So they're solving a problem for you quickly get a, a cab, so drive in that, and just walk away. And they playing on experience. And uh, there are multiple experiences out there in the market, you can take like Latvian example, like we 
paying for parking like already for years by the apps. We're not going and throwing coins and tapping a cards, and that's another example of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think where uh, the merchants, uh, customers, uh, they're gonna focus. They're gonna focus on the things which help them do their business better. Absolutely. So either uh, th this solution should first help address client needs and second it should improve the way a uh, solution pro provider runs their business and if in this space the central banks or uh, the banks will come with, uh, with the idea or support of uh, going through this process uh, the creation of this idea will, will definitely uh, come as a success but there should be joint cooperation it should be pretty much testing with the clients of the uh, already made prototype, and we actually doing it at Citadel. Well, Dain, retailers play uh, quite a crucial role in the uh, adoption of the uh, instant payments based uh, end user solutions. What, what is your opinion, actually? Would you like to have kind of centralized solution like we have with Visa and MasterCard schemes? And, um, well, who should do a first step? Would you request bank to, to deliver something? Or, well, it's, I guess, more typical that banks, bank delivers you something to be able to accept uh, customer payments. So, <clears throat> so um, first of all, I, I think it's beneficial to have central solutions around this. It's, it's hard for us to adopt when there are uh, the smaller solutions that have lower adoption. So centralized solutions have a big advantage. And taking card payments with just two, two main card providers makes it easier for us to accept payments from a wide set of consumers. So I think uh, the availability of centrally supported instant payment uh, possibilities is, is definitely a big advantage. Uh, I would argue that it's the receiver that has the benefit, not so much the payer, whether I pay with my credit card, whether I pay NFC, or I pay with a mobile wallet, it's pretty much instant at the point when I'm paying, the money leaves my account straight away, it's the recipient that re might receive it at a different time period. So that's where there's a, a change in the, the timing. So um, for people paying in our stores, that doesn't really change if they pay with an instant payment or not. The experience is they immediately can walk away with their goods anyway, regardless of when uh, Rimi might receive the money for this. There is <clears throat> there's definitely an advantage to receiving that money earlier um, through instant payments. Um, if it can be, you know, if there's, and naturally if it's one set of instant payments we're servicing, that will definitely make it more simple for us. If we're having to deal with 10 different instant payment providers, that is a complexity that we would love not to deal with. Um, so that standardization would be good. But I think the, um, we'll end up having to, in essence today, from the card, going with the central solutions from card providers, the aggregation of those transactions happens on the card provider side. That's in this essence a service they're providing to retailers. We're receiving the aggregated result of that um, at the end of the day. This, with instant payments, that will move on to us as retailers to handle the, the many transactions that come in, to reconcile that they match up and to move those funds on. So it will move some complexity over to the retailers as well that we'll have to be uh, taking into account in our own business processes to handle the, the, f the funding. Okay. So I would invite to look on the screen. We have a uh, few more uh, new questions there. Well, uh, that the one most liked currently, uh, I would... Uh, Expect that uh, well, it's uh, addressed to Marilis, um, but other you 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 may actually uh, comment and compliment if you want. But I understand the question is about small startups, small fintech, small merchants who actually uh, can uh, create a kind of uh, ecosystem of payment aggregators. So when when fintechs can step in, uh, aggregate payments. And that may serve small merchants and e-commerce. So what are your thoughts there on, on that particular question? Well, I don't think that uh, fintech will be dead after, after this is uh, widely spread. Um, well, I can, I can 
provide the fintech um, perspective from our side. Um, we don't see payment aggregate, aggregation only in terms of card payment or, or instant payment or, you know, a debit, uh, a direct debit, but we also look at it more broadly, like you can also pay as a mobile wallet user, you can also pay with, let's say, mobile carrier billing or connect uh, TransferWise or Moniz or Revolut for that matter. So we look at it for a more broader spec. Um, and, and from the merchant side, uh, it's about bringing together different ways of accepting the payment. So we talk a lot about POS, uh, POS system. So it can be integrated into the system. It, cannot, it can be done without, which was the app-to-app -app payment. It can be, uh, you can accept payments in machines, creating new business to somewhere where the, uh, accepting the payments wasn't possible before. So that's the value creation. Uh, we talk about e-commerce. There are so many ways that you can actually, from the merchant side, combine Internet of Things and e-commerce. And that's creating new value. So it's not about the instant payments. Of course, we like that the money moves very fast. But for us, it doesn't really kind of like matter because we breach the payments. We, we, we don't facilitate them ourselves. We don't do them. And th this is also something that I would like to add is that um, we as a fintech, uh, as I said, we're really uh, agile and we have to be really adaptive and do what's best for us, which means that at the moment we are not under legislation, we're a software provider. So as for when the PSD2 is implemented, then we are a third party service provider. Okay, uh, QC and ML arbitrage, is something relevant you can comment? Yeah, I think we touch on that today. There was yeah. also part of my quote about uh, making equal this digital identity and because, you know, the, the fintechs, they can really decide where, 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 where they go and what jurisdiction to use and uh, some of them in, in this jurisdiction uh, can use a selfie and, uh, and a uh, picture of the passport in other jurisdiction it's just not enough and it's not only about identification it also touch a lot of different rules mm -hmm. i think the question of like this equal legislation across europe for digital identity will need to be raised and it should cover definitely both kyc and aml because we will need to end this arbitrage, it's it just uh, not healthy for, for the business in general because fintechs can go to market quicker in, in some uh, occasions where banks cannot and it's very much fragmented market by market. Okay, thank you. Well, I remember and I promised that we will uh, take this question about central banks operating payment system. It has disappeared for now, but uh, well, if I may, then I will start uh, because we, yes, we, as a central bank, we operate retail payment system in Latvia and historically we had quite many banks here who need an access to currently to SEPA uh, infrastructure. And uh, until we can do that in an efficient manner to and, uh, ensure that our payment system is safe, um, modern, uh, and, and probably can, yeah, let's be frank, compete with our uh, other private systems, but we, we are central bank, we, uh, we, we have a first rule of uh, uh, Cost recovery. We are we are not uh, focusing on 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 the revenues, and and then so far, our market participants need it. We are ready to deliver. But there are some obstacles, like in Estonia, and my discount complement that yeah, there is no demand for such a system domestically, and yeah, that's a decision of central bank to to close the system. Yes. Yep. Uh, well, just to add to that, the question. I think it was also posed to, to me and related to Estonia. We actually do not have an independent instant payment system in Estonia. We used to have a retail payment uh, uh, platform uh, operated by our national central bank up until a few years ago when we had the uh, SEPA payments introduced. We did have a discussion with our uh, banking community and we basically asked them if they want us to upgrade our, uh, our system 
or you can or you think you prefer a commercial solution and they, they basically told us that that no we're fine that we will we will have an alternative system and now that uh, i think it's good that uh, that the ecb is offering the tips platform in addition to the commercial services and to complement it just in order to make sure that uh, we really have uh, the reachability all over the uh, euro areas so that you don't have one commercial platform in one part of Europe and the other in, in some other countries, but, uh, but just to make sure that we re it really is, an, is a jointly uh, accessible and reachable uh, 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 common platform for, for all customers in, in every European country. And I think that's the, that's the main reason that the uh, uh, central bank is behind it. But in general terms, so it doesn't mean that, well, Local market doesn't have an access. We have uh, several alternatives, and uh, European market is very efficient to, uh, in, in providing such alternatives and, and have, an, I would say, great infrastructure for making Euro, Euro credit transfers and especially instant payments, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I would like then to proceed with a very interesting topic about the future technologies. Well, probably disruption, revolution. Well, Petri, you as a, you're, a, I would say, a best expert. What can you say? How consumers can benefit from artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain adoption? What these technologies can bring to payments? Well, in the previous panel, the question of the centrality of data was brought up. And you also brought up the question of what the consumer may or may not want. I mean, I think we're a free market economy in the EU, so things that are not prohibited or considered ethically acceptable can be tried. Um, and what we see coming on the horizon, I think, is definitely a convergence economy centered on data, where data, especially generated by the Internet of Things, could be managed uh, very efficiently by blockchain utilizing smart contracts, also in the interests of the individual citizen, the aforementioned maybe more American consumer, as they also call them there. Um, managing it for monetization. Um, also the possibility of the, the Chinese colleagues to utilize the same technology for more social control. But here in Europe, giving the citizen more possibility to say, I either want to monetize or I want to keep it private or I want to donate it for uh, the good of others and keep some part private, etc. Then going to artificial intelligence, which does the analysis, is thinking new business models. And you also have artificial intelligence on a decentralized model, which is a very interesting development, which is perhaps moving forward most of all in Europe. And at the center of this, you will also have, as then the artificial intelligence sends the data back either to the citizens themselves or to an insurance company, et cetera, as the case may be according to contracts, how you pay and especially pay in micropayments for some of this. And I think instant payments, we can obviously also from the digital single market side only welcome this and especially as a pan-European application. But in these cases, some of these applications are also going to be global. Some of them will be for instance, for accessing some data either by an individual, the, uh, how to say, copyrighted data, newspaper articles, music, and so on, micropayments. And others could be also payments for the citizen consumer for the use of their data, which they wanted, or donations of their data. So, I mean, I think here there's some very interesting work still to be done in the areas of, you know, blockchain governance, smart contracts, also in relation to data, data and the application now of the general data protection regulation to the new decentralized technologies and this can be done and is something we're looking at and then also artificial intelligence the ethical um, framework for the use of that and how we want it to work for the good of humanity and but I think also some very great uh, economic possibilities uh, especially for startups in Europe the so-called deep tech startups but also for our bigger industry which is ready to transform and then my last point on that would be in relation to being a, a free market economy. Some of these things can also go into areas where 
they're not prohibited, but they're also not really foreseen by the legislation, and they might raise issues. And so I think that's very nice that we have the tools that are developing that are sometimes called regulatory sandbox or in different versions in other countries, innovation hubs where the regulators, supervisors can interact with the innovators, also perhaps calm the innovators down that this thing is not regulated, is not covered, is not prohibited, go ahead, or perhaps be very aware of this consumer protection requirement, your technology is okay, but if you lose the, the data or the uh, financial contribution of your, of your consumer, of your partner, then you might have to recompensate them or in other ways make them whole. Um, this is something that we look at very positively. We're going to be using such an approach for our European blockchain services infrastructure, where, as I say, we're working with 27 countries, 26 member states in Norway, in implementing these services ourselves. And then we also, which I, I mentioned I would uh, announce, we have a project, this is in our research funding side, called the FinTech Project, all capital letters. It was their choice, not ours. And this is bringing together 25 different partners addressing 29 EU and uh, EU countries and uh, the 29th is Switzerland and working on a risk management framework for fintech across regulatory areas for big data analytics, artificial intelligence and blockchain. So again working this is collaboration and it's in a research context but there are many regulators on board and ideally all the regulators and supervisors of the member states will be coming to the different workshops and training seminars they'll have over the two years and it's a soft way a capacity building way of preparing for the uptake of the new technologies not forcing it but helping to have a discussion on what are the risks what are the also contractual obligations of the technology provider um, what do you have to make sure that the consumer is protected against and in this way move forward to be able to take advantage of the rapid uptake of these new technologies in Europe to put us ideally in a leadership role and uh, based on our values which are not a monetization of everything or social control but of really putting the citizen first and allowing him or her to make decisions about the way that they want to plan their, their digital or how to say life in general or business model if they're an entrepreneur. Great, sounds great, but well, we are still uh, individual member states with our own interests. Do you see that even if it's not mandatory, so collaboration is, uh, and, and participation is, is, a, is a voluntary, uh, do you see that it's still there is a high interest and, and collaboration is effective enough or you would uh, not exclude kind of uh, common standardization harmonization uh, activities in future I mean, there's different ways of working together. I mean, a number of people uh, were complementing the Payment Service Directive 2, which is the passporting. It's also the same for the end of roaming fees, the end of geo-blocking, uh, the other areas where we have passporting, the proposal, which is also in the FinTech Action Plan for crowdfunding uh, regulation, which will also passport across borders. So that's a legislative way to do it in areas where perhaps it's either too early, let's say like the blockchain or the artificial intelligence, or let's say something like tax harmonization where there's strong member states um, of opposition, then in these kinds of areas you can have either early on or perhaps for a long time uh, a softer level of collaboration. But as I mentioned in relation to this uh, European blockchain partnership on the 10th of April, uh, we've had uh, 27 member states sign up. We only have two missing, Croatia and Hungary, but not due to objections. They haven't uh, organized the mandate to sign. And we've had Norway and Switzerland come on board. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm to work together, and we'll probably have services launched already next year, several services cross-border, maybe in all, uh, all 28 countries and, and Norway and Switzerland. So, I mean, these uh, kind of things can work very well. And I think it uh, doesn't always have to be a piece of legislation, which was actually, as it was mentioned, takes a couple of years, even if we can move more rapidly than it taking the uh, purported four or five years. And we have examples that take a couple of years in the uh, digital single market. Sometimes a method of cooperation like this can be more rapid, and it can also identify, and as we're thinking in the area, for instance, of cross-border recognition of smart contracts, where you need binding legislation after that. But it doesn't have to always be the first choice.
Would you want to compliment other than Marlies <laughs> Vlad? I would ask, that. well, uh, it's... Uh, no, I was still, thinking yeah. about, uh, you said that the legislation takes around five years. Just <laughs> that, 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 that's a stereotype. I know, that's... that's Digital really single market, we took a couple of years but for uh, that, a lot that of that things. <laughs> me to my first initial point that, you know, startups, uh, five years, this is like a lifetime. There is a you can try and test and... But I think the first phase or where the phase where we are at the moment is... Uh, collaboration in, in, in between the fintechs, the, the banking community and the leg legislation and I think that's very very much needed because when we think about future for, for myself um, I don't think it's about the payments at all, it's about the journey of uh, where we're going and you know in the future it will be very common probably to you know people to say uh, you know Alexa buy me the shoes from the whatever site and the payment happens on the background. And this is the kind of new n normality when we talked about instant payments being the new normality well, yesterday, but I think in the future this is where we're heading. And uh, given the fact that we, we spoke about the millennials and uh, they kind of take over and they're more willing to use those services. So in terms of future, I see that it's more focused on Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, as you mentioned, but it also imposes quite a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, for, for example, um, if we take Internet of uh, Things, uh, which, which is like machines that are interacting with uh, each other, with each other. So let's take a home, uh, I don't know, a blender, which is connected to the internet. And uh, let's say it's been cyber attacked by whatever reason. So this imposes new, like a set of rules for insurance for the, for the whole specter. So I think it's not only payment related, like no. future of where we're going, but it's much broader. So this is why we come back to where we are today. The collaboration is so important. Um, I just wanted to I made just, a, just a remark on the slow, slowness of regulation. <laughs> I think it's actually no it's, uh, no, it's, it's quite okay. That, uh, and I think ev not everything has to be regulated uh, oh, by okay. legal acts. And it's actually mm -hmm. quite good that, uh, that some of the standards that are really uh, agreed upon among the uh, private sector participants and only the central banks or the regulators can step in mm -hmm. later and sort of support the initiative. And this is how much of the uh, uh, much of the payments uh, area has really developed also in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ask about the future, then I also find it, I always find it difficult to uh, forecast, especially the, fu the future. <laughs> uh, so I have to make this disclaimer, but when it comes to payments, then uh, I think the trends are really obvious as a result of uh, uh, people preferring more and more electronic solutions, and now we have the instant payments and the uh, new payment services directive that creates new opportunities. So we sort of have a sense of, uh, sense of where it's all going. Uh, and previously there was, uh, there was a question also on the uh, KYC and anti-money laundering rules. I think uh, this certainly is an issue that you, when you have those independent uh, new companies, even if they have the, uh, for payment service providers, even, they have, even if they have similar requirements when it comes to uh, uh, identifying their customers and, uh, and monitoring the uh, suspicious transactions. Mm -hmm. I think the degree of seriousness that, uh, that they are doing it with and the amount of resources that they can devote to this, of course, is not comparable to uh, what most banks really mm -hmm. uh, today are doing. So this uh, certainly is an issue and, uh, and that, that needs to be addressed at some point. Okay, so we have 20 minutes left, and before we start to draw some conclusions, uh, I would uh, ask if we have any questions in the audience. Yes, we have definitely at least one. Right. Hello. Um. Evita Zanev, a digital banking uh, user experience consultant. Uh, so far we have spoken only about the benefits of uh, instant payments, but since we touched upon the future of payments and moving towards uh, invisible payments, so what do you, th what do you see as drawbacks of, of this? For instance, uh, from bank perspective, have you noticed that people are 
uh, spending too much, like uh, having uh, more incentives for um, uh, impulse uh, purchases rather than saving. Have you seen savings decline as a result of uh, too easy payments? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I, I think, uh, thanks, actually, great, great question. Uh, I would start with uh, the generally the analytics. You know, there were a lot of market research on payment analytics and helping people to understand uh, what, what and where they spent. And if you look back, majority of the companies who implement the payment analytics, they actually failed. And a lot of them recognize that, that it was a failure because what's important for consumer is not to know what I just spent, but where I can save. And that's potentially where we can move with all the artificial intelligence and analytics so, and uh, help consumers. So think about, about the invisible payment. You walk in the store, you look at the good, you scan it, and artificial intelligence say you, hey, you know what? Uh, online you can buy it 15% cheaper, but it's going to be delivered to you in a few days, and it's your decision whether you want to get it in a few days later or you pay more expensive now. So uh, there, there, there will be, I think, the different new things which technology will allow us to do. So far, yes, it was uh, more focused on like doing analytics post uh, you've done some things. We will have more data points about the behavior based on these data points. We should be able to help clients save money, uh, save some costs, and that's where I think uh, potentially the, the future lies. Um, maybe a little bit on this, like, um, immediate, like immediate and invisible payments. Uh, we know like Amazon Go, which uh, they're they, they piloting it in, in the few stores. They're supposed to open another one. Um, there are a lot of discussion whether it's a, it's a good or bad project, but recently much bigger initiatives came up where two big players uh, in the U.S. actually teamed up to change the way retail payments are done, and it's Microsoft and Walmart. And they're doing the similar things because if you, if you, if you think about the solution which is used by Microsoft, uh, or not by Microsoft, but Amazon, it will be very hard for Dynis to put it in his stores uh, because each of the, these chips and cameras which I installed there, they're heavily expensive. What uh, Microsoft uh, with Walmart is trying to do, they're trying to create a very cheap and economic prototype so it can be scalable. Once this is there, we're going to see much more of invisible payments in the, our ordinary stores. It's going to change the way we actually do the payments and uh, purchase the things. But things most probably will happen much more quicker online, mm -hmm. where these changes are already evolving. I see that we could smoothly uh, switch to Dynis and ask him mm -hmm. uh, his opinion about Amazon Go concept. But before, uh, Vlad, I, I would like to pick one question here and ask you, well, what of future technologies we have already mentioned, and blockchain in particular, uh, have a potential to be used in banking community. Uh, and I mean also to uh, make internal processes more efficient, but as well, and sure, uh, as it was mentioned in the question, to improve uh, banking services to the customers, actually. Uh, uh, to be honest, I think uh, blockchain as a technology for the market of our size uh, in the nearest future is just the same hype as, like, you know, go and trade bitcoins. Uh, we, are, we are small market. Uh, things which uh, we need to impact in the small market, I think they, they are mu mu much more s simpler. Um, we will just need to look at where the biggest uh, spin of cost and the complexity is, and that's where the focus should be. A blockchain can help us country-wise. It can help us to optimize like a lot of processes, like with like land register, a lot of processes which lays behind different deals. It ultimately will help also financial institutions because uh, guess what? Like we will facilitate transactions much quicker with less paperwork, with less resources involved, and uh, with uh, much better experience. But uh, I think that uh, same potentially could lay uh, with, with the analytics. You know, there are a lot of discussion that you know AI is coming, and then everyone needs to invest heavily. But uh, 
Yeah, for a lot of technologies, for you to be a front runner and be able to cope with your cost, you need to be in the different scale economy. We most probably will see how other big players do it uh, in the much larger markets. We will learn from their mistakes and take best technologies and place them later instead of spending significant amount of cost identifying these technologies early on. Maybe any? Uh, if, you, if you allow me, actually, I quite like the question from the audience on, uh, on what are the possible risks or drawbacks of uh, instant payments, if I can come, yeah. uh, go back to that. So that reminds me of a discussion uh, with a senior banker who said, that why, why are you talking about those fast payments? That I, when I buy something or get a service, I always prefer to pay as late as possible, and if possible, then never. <laughs> but uh, so he maybe he doesn't like it. But uh, at, at the end, even even he might uh, might perhaps uh, enjoy some of the uh, some of the new services that we may see as a result of those developments. Uh, but I think uh, the AML issue, of course, that uh, has to be addressed, and it might be an adi additional risk. Although even today, when you make a uh, make a bank transfer, it's not it, there's not really anyone physically checking it, and it all has to be computerized, anyways, and it can really work very fast also uh, for instant payments. Uh, as a central bank, we uh, by nature we also like to uh, uh, discuss risks to to uh, to everything uh, when it comes to payments. Uh, while trying to encourage developments and innovation, we, we, uh, we at the same time also emphasize that we don't really see cash uh, disappearing. Uh, you have the uh, risk that some of the electronic systems, they may be down occasionally and you don't, uh, don't uh, have the possibility to make the payment that you, that you want to. So I think you, you need for such kind of emergencies uh, uh, always uh, also cash, and this will uh, probably uh, remain. Uh, and actually, listening to this first panel, I, I started thinking myself about the risk of uh, overspending by people that uh, you also referred to. If it, if it becomes so easy to buy things without even noticing, uh, it's not really a topic uh, that we at the central bank deal with too much, but. Uh, uh, but certainly it's easy, it is easier to overspend uh, uh, using such digital methods than compared to a certain amount of cash that you have in your, in your pocket. So perhaps we need more uh, sort of financial education to go along with that. I mean, I would just say on that same point, I mean, this brings it back to us. Uh, we should try to implement innovative ideas as quickly as possible and make sure that there's always consumer protection underlying that and a possibility of appeal because no system is going to work perfectly. And maybe it's my non-millennial age, but I think of this Amazon Go concept and to me it raises some questions. Will this always correctly um, tag and price the items that I've actually, actually taken? I mean, it's very anecdotal, but I mean, for instance, a, a lot of platforms think all the time when I'm not in Luxembourg, I'm in Luxembourg. So I mean, things that, there's reasons for this to do with servers and so on, but I mean, things don't always work perfectly, and then I have to say that I have some unease about a consumer about just taking things in a shop and putting them back and so on, and considering that this would perfectly give me the, the, the bill that I would have. But I mean, I think this kind of technology can be perfected to a very high level, but in the meantime, it should be possible for the citizen, the consumer, to have recourse and to be able to follow and have transparency on the way that things were uh, sure. adjusted. Sure, absolutely. And we actually have one more question related to drawbacks. Uh, so, well, people now use credit transfers to pay, usually to pay bills or make it transfer, so it's a push payment, and, and cards have uh, different, uh, absolutely different uh, procedures to ensure customer protection and uh, safety and uh, procedures against fraud. And, and then, well, for me it looks quite be, to be a quite crucial uh, part of customer protection, but now it's maybe too early to understand if instant payments go to physical stores and you can pay uh, at, at POS uh, with instant payment. Well, how this part will evolve, what, how we can ensure the same level of customer protection, we just should, should explain that 
there are different procedures. So. But, but you most probably will link it with some very secured credentials. So today, like, you know, to do the instant payment, you're logging in your uh, bank. And uh, for the digital banks who will play in this digi digi digital space and uh, create some sort of solution banks in the pockets that where they will have, like, same security. If I think today about my, uh, my bank, like, you uh, go in the app with the face ID, and uh, you can confirm the instant payment. So if, uh, think about the e-commerce uh, potentially like maybe a year from now where you go to the store, you select the bank, uh, it push uh, confirmation to your app, you look at your app and it says done. It's fully secured, it's used a secure communication channel between the app and the bank. I think to some extent it's even more secure than uh, having your card transactions, which uh, the, in, in some cases might, might be fraudulent. And then you can potentially use your card's credential and third party can, can do the payment, which will not happen in case of this uh, secured environment and notification to the device. Because the device belongs to you, uh, it's very hard uh, actually to replicate your biometrics. Um, unless, you know, maybe someone cuts your finger and try to do it or try to figure out how you <laughs> do the different uh, other stuff of... Uh, but, 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 but the thing is, like, uh, you just get into the more secure environment. Physical POS, I think, is different. On the physical POS, we will need to see more of the development and we will need to create some infrastructure to facilitate these payments. Uh, but I think it's coming, like with some POSs, uh, which, uh, which I've recently seen, where you have already the App Store, like in the POS, where you can s select the app. I think the POS manufacturers are going exactly the same direction, so they're pushing additional interface, because we all know that most probably cards, same as cash, will stay for a while. And uh, on the similar infrastructure, we will need to deliver to the merchants uh, alternative solutions and that's why like there is a, a lot of discussion on what this alternative solution will be whether it will be the QR code which again can be more secured because you again use your mobile device certification or you use uh, infrastructure which is more established but when more, more costly so it's time to conclude, and as you represent different areas, I would like to invite you to uh, explain us or, or share your scenario of nearest future. How do you see it from your perspective? And I would like to start with Dianis, because we have a question to him on hold. So car manufacturer, when it announced a concept car, so usually it looks quite crazy, and the next generation of, of Car, e cars it delivers are quite different. Amazon Go concept, frictionless, invisible payments, is it, in your opinion, a concept rather than a logical next level of, of, of evolution of physical source? Um, <clears throat> I, I think it's definitely the type of uh, direction we will see more of going forward. Uh, I think Amazon, as typical for them, are really experimenting on the cutting edge. Um, they are ready to accept the losses of incorrectly uh, you know, giving something away free of charge or for refunding anything that accidentally has been charged. And that's extra cost for that. And they're investing very heavily in this, which they can from their financial position. Uh, so I think that we'll see, we'll see that continuing quite aggressively. And I think we'll see new players trying to offer uh, cheaper solutions in this area that are building on that. But that, that technology is still quite uh, immature to, to reach that mass market that we'd need for, for reasonable prices and the, the retail uh, the retail sector is with a low margin it doesn't leave a lot of profit margin for bringing in such technology whether customers would really pay for the extra benefit of of not having someone uh, not having simpler technologies I'm quite doubtful that that would happen in a, a grocery setting very actively in this market. Uh, but we're certainly looking at how can we use technologies to make it easier for consumers to make their purchases and to make it uh, to reduce the or to add automation in our stores that would make it uh, less costly to for consumers to be buying. Okay. Marilis, how does future look like? 
Uh, no, I actually started thinking about the Amazon uh, uh, example. Uh, it's quite common, I, I think, in Estonia. I, I haven't been shopping so much in Latvia, but uh, it's quite common that uh, you walk in the store, uh, then you take your card, uh, whatever, the loyalty card, and then you get the remote thingy so you can scan the products. But if I look at it from our perspective, it's already developed. Um, so it means that you can actually take your mobile phone scan the products with the mobile phone and it's it's kind of a similar experience that you, then you just walk out because you already have the payment method added so it's not very far anymore it's very very near if i can respond to that quickly Please we've do. actually uh, ike in sweden deployed this type of solution mm -hmm. and the findings were it was appealing for a small number of mm -hmm. devices that you could hold on see on your screen at one time but once you had to scroll up and down it was no longer an efficient way of buying so it could be useful in a, an express concept Why where scrolling? You, because customers find the experience of using the the mobile phone was not convenient when they were looking through the different devices different uh, items they had scanned on their baskets okay. or looking through comparing their shopping list uh, a longer shopping list trying to find which item they were buying mm -hmm. and so on so uh, we've looked at that option and there are situations where that could be of interest particularly in more convenience type locations but it's Absolutely. the user experience uh, in practice when it was deployed was found not to be really appealing to the consumers themselves which we found as a surprising observation from the consumer. well I think that the adoption needs time that's that's what I earlier said that at the moment we're still in the phases of where we consider contactless to be quite an innovation but I think that uh, when we talk about BSD2 again then for a fintech it's a very good opportunity to kind of not use but work with the bank and use the leverage and trust that bank already has uh, so this is what I see in the near nearer future uh, that you can actually scale with uh, with the bank can we actually um, predict that well there will be I don't know cheap under the ski or still we will give more uh, more preference to finger and there are, there are risks that thing, finger will be cut or it's a mobile phone so with Amazon co Go concept so can we predict this because well you know we I still need to go to physical stores you no know, I was joking yesterday and then uh, we were discussing in a smaller group that at the moment we launched NFC payments and sticker and bracelet we had to request to our banks for the people to personalize chip under the skin <laughs> already like <laughs> happening here in, in, in <laughs> Latvia so you see, uh, there are the, uh, plenty of technologies coming in, but the question is what will be these technologies which will actually take the masses? And you now I, I see how that, well, a year ago we introduced the NFC payment, the stickers, the bracelet. Uh, people who started to use actually the solution, they are pretty much into this solution. They like it, they want to use it more. But uh, not every consumer is ready mm -hmm. and uh, to go and test new things. So we must probably will need to be in the future also very selective where, where we invest our money and efforts. We need to think what are the best experiences uh, which we can bring uh, to customers. But uh, I ultimately see that both banks and fintechs, they will continue to play in this arena. Fintechs at some point, like uh, once they understand that they won't actually scale, they will get exposed to the same regulation as the banks. Mm -hmm. And with touch surfing and that, like Revolut, once they want to get bigger, they will get the banking license, same IML rules, same identification rules will gradually come, capital reserves. Like, they will need to start thinking about the stuff we having headache every day. Uh, so from that perspective, fintechs can be a great front runners. They can go and check the universes and common partner with the uh, companies who having trust mm -hmm. in front of the consumers and there always will be this mutual partnership. Meanwhile, I think uh, banks there, they, they will go into the innovation and uh, they will do all their own prototype solution, they will bring them to market because I think it's also about the perception. Uh, the perception cannot be that only small company with uh, like being closer to customer can innovate even big players can innovate and bring the solution which consumer needs on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, would you agree with my statement uh, made on mobile banking? Well, people want to have their 
bank actually everywhere at any time so and mobile device can provide it yeah you know i i can tell you like my bank is is now everywhere so uh we we launched the solution uh it was i think uh, six um, six months ago we launched it to the small group of customers we exposed it to most everyone and we continue to develop uh, the di digital bank you can easily open the app with the uh, f fingertip or face id you can actually communicate to the bank which uh, we try to do, to do differently we think at, about the digital from the perspective that that's not about going like full speed digital and uh, digitizing every possible thing uh, customers, they losing connection uh, once they don't have a personal touch. So that's why like, we putting a lot of emphasis of the customer service and uh, being really customer centric, even being a digital. So bank will be in the pocket, service will need to stay there. Some services will go into this pocket. So uh, on top of looking at the balance and understanding of uh, what you pay, payments you need to make, you will see more, much more of the services uh, go, going into your device. Well, Petri, you have an honor to conclude and say the final word here. And well, my question would be how far we are from digital humans. So artificial intelligence, <laughs> machine learning, <laughs> blockchain, what, what next and, and how far we have to, be, to become well, well, on this, finishing on this fairly philosophical question, I mean, it's actually a good opportunity to say, I mean, I think probably the concept is more augmented intelligence than artificial intelligence. The machine learning, the art, so-called artificial intelligence, helping the human to work better. And I think it's the same message for the finance sector and for payments here today. Uh, rapid adoption of new innovative technologies, but for the consumer, for the citizen, for the economy, and for the society, I mean, for our needs. Um, but I think this is coming rapidly, and I think Europe can be in the forefront, but I think we can also put it very much in the framework of our values. Thank you, that definitely. Well, just yeah, sure. one quick comment. I saw there was a tweet about myself saying cash is dominant. I think I should correct that. <laughs> my, my message was that we had more than the 64% as cashless. That's what I mean. So we have cashless is the predominant payment method. We have cards I, being the primary method. I wanted to say that the point made by Petris was good enough, but this one is uh, e e even better because, well, let's conclude that uh, Let's do more payments, yeah. So <laughs> more payments in future, <laughs> and that will be a good point. And time is up, uh, and I would like to thank you. Thank you, Petris, uh, Vlad, Marilis, uh, Madis, uh, and uh, Dainis, and thank you, audience, uh, for your involvement, for your questions. Uh, I guess you have plenty of questions, and you can try to uh, catch our experts and discuss uh, with them uh, during lunchtime or afterwards. And, um, well, it was a pleasure for me to be part of this event here. Thank you. Thank you.